Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is Daily Drop number 179. We talked a lot about the book Relentless Pursuit by Bradley Edwards that came out on March 31st. And leading up to that date, the Daily Mail and other outlets had released some teaser uh, excerpts from that book, different uh, articles written by Bradley Edwards that had to do with what you could expect to find within the pages of his new book. So we covered all of those, and I had thought that the last one was last Sunday, but Daily Mail has a new one out today, and I guess this one wraps up their series covering uh, Relentless Pursuit and Bradley Edwards' new book. So we're going to jump right into this article, and this will wrap up our coverage of the release of the book as well, and this will lead into, like I was saying, and uh, as, as a few people have requested, we'll do a review of Relentless Pursuit in a couple of weeks, and I'm also going to dedicate a show, we'll talk about the book Filthy Rich as well. I think both of those are more than worthy of uh, getting a review here on the podcast, so we'll definitely do that. So... Let's wrap up the coverage with the Daily Mail and see what Bradley Edwards has to say in this final piece. Headline, Epstein's Harem of Hell. Courtney was just 14, a skinny girl with braces on her teeth, when she was lured into the Palm Beach home of Prince Andrew's pedophile friend, and her horrifying story echoes those of many others. And this article was written by the Mail on Sunday, but it is Bradley Edwards' account of what occurred as he saw it. The young woman's piercing green eyes stared resolutely ahead as she shook hands with her lawyer for the first time. I've been trying to get someone to help me, she told him. I'm cooperating with the FBI against Jeffrey Epstein. Whoa, said the lawyer, a 32-year-old named Bradley Edwards, who had just set up his own firm in Hollywood, Florida. Can you imagine? Right? Imagine being a lawyer, 32 years old, you just set up your own firm, and and this is what comes through the door, somebody who says they're working with the FBI trying to take down some power, rich, powerful guy. As a lawyer, these are the kind of cases I'm guessing that you live for, right? To really get into the thick of things, make a difference. You think, you know, you would think that a lot of these lawyers, defense attorneys, that's what they, you know, one of the motivations is they want to make sure that people are getting a fair shake. So for... Bradley Edwards, it must have been something else to get that kind of information. It must have been startling for him. Let's start at the beginning. It had only been an hour or so earlier that Edwards had received a phone call out of the blue. Had he heard the name Jeffrey Epstein? He said he had not. The caller was a fellow lawyer, Jay Howell, who had founded America's National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I mean, this guy who called him, Jay Howell, he founded America's National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. This guy was calling Bradley Edwards about Jeffrey Epstein. So this gentleman who had started this uh, center, Jay Hal, knew who Jeffrey Epstein was, knew what Jeffrey Epstein was about, knew that he was obviously a sick guy. But you mean to tell me that the authorities had no idea? His pals in high society in New York had no idea? I'm sorry, but it just doesn't, it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense, and I'm not going to accept that narrative. He was seeking legal advice for a 20-year-old woman who had been sexually assaulted by a powerful man in Palm Beach about six years earlier, in 2002. Edward's office was nearby. Could he spare some time to talk to her? The woman's name was Courtney Wilde. And look, again, Courtney is another one who is ultra brave, right? It, just from what we just read about her right here, just from that those little excerpts about her stepping up to the plate, working with the FBI, looking to go after Epstein, it just shows you everything you need to know about her character and her bravery. So you know she uh, she is definitely one of the uh, one of the the brave survivors who has who has come forward to give a voice to those who may not have you know come to the the conclusion that it's time for them to come forward or or. Girls who have been, you know, abused by Epstein and whose voices have been squelched. So when you see girls like Courtney Wilde come forward with, you know, the other uh, survivors, it, it's, you know, 
it's, it's, it's a big deal, right? It's really a big deal because they have been told for so long by these powerful people that they're liars or they're, they're, you know, bad people or they do drugs or this, that, or the other thing. And nobody listened to them for so long. So when we see them come forward now and we see them tell their story and we see them stand shoulder to shoulder, you can't do anything but admire the courage that they're showing. And so began for Brad Edwards a series of events that became, in his own words, his personal life's mission, the pursuit of Jeffrey Epstein on behalf of the survivors. The more I learned, he says, the more determined I was to bring his manipulation and abuse to an end. I, I understand completely because, like I've said a million times, I came when I first got involved in this whole entire Jeffrey Epstein fiasco, this case... I had no interest in this sort of thing, really. It wasn't my, it wasn't, you know, the thing that I was focused on. I was focused on Near East policy and geopolitical moves in the Middle East. That's where I was really focused. And I got this information, right, with everybody else, obviously, you know, started getting a little more deeper into it as I had articles sent to me, people telling me that I needed to look into it. And, you know, I had always followed at a, at a distance what was going on because it had political ramifications, right? So in 2008, when he first got arrested and leading up to that, you know, you heard some blurbs and there was a few articles, but they never really scratched more than the surface. So... After the second time around, when Julie K. Brown's article started coming out and the story got legs, I started to get more interested in it, right? And I started reading every article I could possibly find, and I started seeing all sorts of weird things that didn't add up to me. So as I looked deeper, I got more aggravated with what occurred, with what went on, and with the way the survivors were treated and the way the Justice Department and the the whole entire justice system was manipulated by Jeffrey Epstein and his so-called elite lawyers. And that was what motivated me to be here every single night with you guys, two or two times a day, I should say, talking about this case. So I can understand... You know, and that's somebody, I, I wasn't talking to anyone who survived this at that point. I didn't know anybody that even involved in the case. I really just didn't know much about it. So I could understand that Bradley Edwards got this fired up and made it his life's goal when he has these girls coming in and asking for help face to face. Can you imagine how motivated that would make you to want to kick in doors and help these girls out? Because it certainly got me motivated enough to start this podcast and to go scorched earth on these people on a nightly basis. So I can only imagine being right in the middle, middle of it like Bradley Edwards. So it was a crusade that would take over his life for more than a decade. Courtney's story was harrowing. Describing her troubled childhood, she told Edwards, My dad wasn't around and my mom had a problem with drugs. We've seen this over and over with the girls, right? A lot of these girls have come from broken homes. They look for girls like this that are vulnerable, right? The most vulnerable amongst us. And then they start with the grooming process. They start with the whole, you know, uh, normalizing what's going on around them when anyone from the outside looking in should understand that it's not normal. But to them, it's it, it becomes normalized behavior because... They're manipulated into thinking that this sort of thing is the way people in so-called the upper crust of society, that's just the way things go there. And these girls, you know, they come from broken homes. They don't have much money. Their parents are gone, perhaps. You know, one, one parent is working and the other one's split. So they don't have the supervision they might, you know, that, that a two-family, uh, a, a two-parent family might have. And then you entice them with some money. Two, three hundred dollars is a lot of money when you're broke. I don't know. I can't stress that enough. There's a lot of people that don't understand what it's like to have nothing. And, you know, you have a chance to have two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars. You're 14, 15, 16 years old. All your friends are wearing fly gear. Everybody has on the newest whatever designer brand is popular at the time. And, you know, your parents are struggling to make ends meet. So you might not have the dopest gear. You might not have all the new shoes or the new clothes, or you're, you might not be able to go with your friends to the beach for the weekend or for the day or whatever it may be. So they have this guy, Jeffrey Epstein, show up and he's this really rich guy. He's a benefactor almost. They think they're going over there for a massage, right? Well, once they're over there, things turn into something else. And before you know it, the whole entire situation is normalized to them. And when you look at it from the outside, obviously, you know, from 
where normal people sit, you realize there's nothing normal about it. And it's disgusting and sad that these girls come from, they already come from enough strife and enough setback that it, it, they don't need the extra nonsense from someone like Jeffrey Epstein, right? Talk about having no chance to get out of the starting blocks. And that's what we see with a lot of these girls. And it's, it, really, it really bothers me a lot. Yet she was determined to make a success of her life. By age of 13, she was in the school band, a cheerleader, and doing well in her exams. But she had no money and a few personal belongings. Again, that's what, that's what I'm talking about. You know, when you don't have anything, a few hundred bucks is huge. It's a big deal, especially when you're a kid, right? And you see from her activity, she was in band, she was a cheerleader. Those things cost money. You want to go out with the girls after, you know, the, the football game? You got to have some dough. You want to go out with the band guy, the band uh, the band uh, friends of yours? You got to have some money to get some hamburgers, right? So you can see the motivation. And you can see how Epstein manipulated that into a situation that benefited him, into a situation where he was able to normalize his behavior. Her only resource was her sheer willpower. In 2002, age 14, Courtney was told by a friend, by a friend Lynn, that she could make $200 by giving a rich man who lived locally a massage. It was an easy decision to make. Courtney took a cab with Lynn to the man's home. Epstein's house was in the billionaire district of Palm Beach Island, not far from Donald Trump's famous Mar-a-Lago club. Mesmerized, Courtney was escorted upstairs with Lynn to a bedroom where a massage table was set up. A skinny youngster with braces, Courtney was sexually inexperienced and she was nervous. I mean, just think about that setup right there. So try and put yourself in her shoes. I know it's impossible for anyone to put themselves in her shoes to see, to, to feel what she felt. But if, you know, reading it, and I always try and, you know, imagine the situation as I'm reading it, right? And it's just, it's so disturbing to think about this little girl in there, you know, not naive about what's going on, not knowing really the big picture or what, what is really about to occur. And this disgusting deviant, Jeffrey Epstein, comes in shuffling in in his disgusting ass towel, that gross ass hairy chest, and that weird looking face of his. It's enough to make me want to vomit. She had never seen a house this big before, nor been in the presence of someone as powerful as the man she was about to massage. Not that she even knew what a massage was. All she knew was that an old man wanted one. While standing beside the empty table with her friend, a graying man walked into the room wearing only a towel. I'm Jeffrey, he said. What is your name? Nice to meet you. He smiled warmly before extending his hand to shake Courtney's. She felt her anxiety disappear. The man lay face down on the table. Rub my back, he told Courtney. Work from the middle of the back up to the tops of the legs, down. You always want to... You always want the blood to circulate away from the heart. Now think about this. This is a 14-year-old girl. All right? A 14-year-old girl walks in. He walks in. He's in his towel. Gross, disgusting-ass Jeffrey Epstein. You know he didn't even ask her age. He didn't care, right? He didn't. He wants them as young as possible. So it's perfect for him. He sees this little young-looking girl with the braces, you know, and this is this is the way Jeffrey Epstein would conduct himself three times a day. This is how Jeffrey Epstein acted at least three times a day. And nobody knew. Nobody had any idea, huh? Sorry, not buying it. He asked about her family, her life, her school, her boyfriends, and her interests. For the first time in her life, an adult was listening to her. Epstein told her he was a brain surgeon and that he too had come from humble beginnings. You can see the grooming process take place right? Oh, I understand you. I, I understand. I sympathize with you. I came from a broken home too. You can be safe with me. I'm a good guy. I'm a brain surgeon. And you you know, you understand a 14 year old girl naive of what's going on. Of course, she's going to buy into it. Look where she is. She's in this big house, billionaires, supposed to billionaires house, this huge gigantic mansion. And she's going to get paid to give him a massage. She thinks. And Epstein begins to play his game, the mind game, begins to psychologically bend her to his will. And we've seen it over and over and over, the pattern that Jeffrey Epstein would use. And it's disheartening 
to have to read it so many times and know that nothing was done for so long. He said that he had, ma he had amassed enormous wealth, which made him friends with the most powerful people in the world. Again, he throws that out there so it's in her head, right? In case she wants to tell anybody what happened, well, he already put it in her head, planted it there, planted the seed that he's friends with powerful people. And what happens if you're friends with powerful people? Well, you don't get in trouble, right? He could help her achieve her ambitions. Halfway through the massage, he told Lynn to leave the room. What Courtney didn't know was that her friend was also receiving money, a finder's fee for bringing another girl to the mansion. Epstein rolled over onto his back and removed his towel. Courtney froze. He told her not to worry, that this was normal and natural. He assured her that she didn't have to do anything she didn't want to. He closed his eyes and told her to pinch his nipples. I mean, it's disturbing to read, right? We're, we have to remember, keep it in context here, we're talking about a 14-year-old girl. And Jeffrey Epstein kicks out her friend, who was used to bring another girl there, obviously, kicks her out of the room, and then after trying to, you know, let her know that he understood her, they come from the same kind of upbringing, he comes from a, you know, a, a simple upbringing as well, and he, how he's a good guy, he was doing that so she would trust him, right? He was building trust with her. And then we see the next step. He gets rid of the friend, rolls over, and begins the next part of his psychological abuse leading to actual physical abuse of Courtney. Confused, Courtney complied. In an increasingly direct voice, Epstein kept telling her, Harder, harder, harder. He then sexually pleasured himself. As soon as he had finished, he hopped up off the table, paid her $200, and left her to find her own way back downstairs. Wherever Courtney looked, there were photographs of fully or partially naked young girls. One seemed to be about four years old. I mean, look, isn't it obvious by now, after all of these articles that we've read, all of the information that's come out, all of the stuff we've heard from first-hand witnesses, first-hand accounts like Bradley Edwards, and, you know, from Courtney and Maria and Annie and Virginia... Isn't that enough evidence? How much more evidence does the Justice Department require? Why do they keep dragging their feet? There is no logical answer for why there, have, there haven't been mass arrests in this case. How can anyone, how can any prosecutor with the power to go after these people read this sort of stuff and not be enraged? How can they not be so motivated and fired up to arrest these people that they have to be held back by the rest of the folks in the office? Because I know if I had this sort of evidence as a prosecutor, I would find something to make it, to make it stick. There, all the things these people have done, all the evidence that's here, you're telling me there's not one charge that they can get slapped with that would stick? I don't buy it. Sorry, I do not buy that. There was one female figure, however, who was older and appeared in many photographs, sometimes in naked, sometimes naked, and at other times with her clothes on. She also appeared with Epstein alongside famous people, including the Pope. Courtney later learned this was Ghislaine Maxwell, Jeffrey Eps Jeffrey's longtime girlfriend. Yeah, boy, oh boy, with the Pope too, huh? Does it, does it shock anybody that Jeffrey Epstein was taking pictures with the Pope? Certainly doesn't shock me. On the way home, Lynn, Lynn told Courtney that what had happened was completely normal. This is what rich people do, she said. They're only trying to help a bunch of poor trailer park kids like us who need a break in life. The next day, Courtney was asked if she wanted to work again. And this is what I was talking about. You see, Courtney has already been brainwashed into, excuse me, you see, Lynn was already brainwashed into thinking that this was normal, that this is how rich people conducted themselves. And the girls had nothing else to go on. They don't know any rich people. They're from, you know, like they just said, trailer parks and, you know, uh, urban areas of, you know, downtrodden, lower middle class. They don't know how rich people conduct themselves. They got brought to this mansion and her friend brings her and her friend's like, oh, this is normal. What is a 14-year-old expected to think? What do you think that the 14-year-old is supposed to say or do at that point? I mean, you know, it's so disturbing. 
it is so disturbing to think that this occurred the way it did for so long and that so many girls had to suffer after this whole entire cabal was outed by Maria Farmer and Annie Farmer. How is it possible that this continued? That's the real question we should all be asking ourselves. In no time, she was being whisked, whisked by Epstein's private chauffeur back to the mansion. Whoever that is, the private chauffeur, he should be brought up on charges as well for being part of this, okay? Aiding, aiding and abetting, whatever you may want to, whatever charge that the feds want to throw at him, I'm sure they have plenty that they can use, he should be brought in as well. He's going to pick up a minor to bring her to Jeffrey Epstein's house to be sexually assaulted. This time, Epstein appeared naked. I like you, he said. When you give me my massage, take your top off and take off your shorts, too. It's a better experience for everyone. You'll see. During the massage, he reached up and placed his hand on her right breast. Take off your bra. It'll be fine, he told her. Look, man, this is disturbing stuff to read, right? And, you know, it's the kind of thing that I just, it's its abhorrent. It's abhorrent to even think that this sort of thing occurs on this planet, and it does though, and it's prevalent. There are a lot of people like Jeffrey Epstein out there, and they might not be doing it to the same scope that Jeffrey Epstein was doing it, but if, if you think that this isn't a prevalent thing going on and this isn't a big problem worldwide, you are not paying attention. I was not paying attention forever either until I started looking into this case. This is a serious problem, and anyone, anyone who is just a, a decent human being should be standing up and going crazy about this kind of shit. What choice did she have? Courtney was alone with one of the most powerful brain surgeons in the world being paid, paid in cash for just one hour of her time. What was overwhelmingly clear to Edwards by this point, as Courtney told him her story, was Epstein's manipulation. The lawyer felt an increasing sense of fury as further details unfolded. Before long, Courtney explained that she was bringing her own friends to Epstein's mansion. Often, she and Lynn approached girls at the mall, at school, in the park, at the beach, anywhere they could think of. And again, you see, that's part of it. That's part of the whole brainwashing and, uh, uh, and, and bringing them over, conforming them to what you want. So now, not only are you abusing them, but you're sending them out to bring in other girls so that it happens to them as well while using these these young girls that you're abusing at the same time as a way to reassure the new girls that are being brought over that everything's kosher, that this is just the way the, that rich people conduct themselves. And to tell you the truth, after researching this and, and getting this deep, maybe it is the way these people in New York conduct themselves. Maybe that's how they all conduct themselves. I don't know. I'll tell you what, I don't trust any of them at this point, and not one of them have, has ever stepped up and done the right thing in, in regards to this case. As Epstein became more familiar with the duo, he pushed the sexual boundaries further, as well as his demands for more girls. What had begun as a seemingly cordial, cordial request was now a command. Courtney was expected to bring girls. She was told that if she didn't, she would disappoint Epstein. And you see how he, he would break them down, right? The abuse, break them down, take control of them that way, then send them out to get other girls. At first, it's a request like, oh yeah, do this for me. And then before you know it, you're sucked in and now it's your job. Not only are you bringing girls in to get abused, you're getting abused and she's caught in this cycle of perpetual abuse that just doesn't stop. This, she understood, was now a threat, but Courtney's relationship with him was complex. The longer it went on, the more indebted she felt to him. She did not want to let down the man who had become her friend, father figure, employer, and master, someone who always spoke to her politely. Epstein's sexual appetite was extraordinary, she said. Whenever in town, he would typically have three or four of these massages a day, each time with a separate teenager. At 17, Courtney was worried that she was becoming too old for him. Think about that for a minute. Let that sink in. Put that in your pipe and toke that up. 17. Too old for him. And all of these people around him, they're going to try and get off by saying, oh, we didn't know they were underage. 
that sorry ass excuse for a human being, the prince of punk asses, Prince Andrew, is going to say, oh, I never saw him with any young girls. Yeah, right. But one day, he asked her to go to his house. On arrival there, he led her to his swimming pool where several young, tall, thin girls were sunbathing naked. Despite all she'd done in the last three years, she was shocked. Yikes, man. This is horrifying. Upstairs in a bedroom, she saw a beautiful young model named Nadia. Epstein told Courtney he had purchased Nadia from her family in Yugoslavia. She was now part of his harem. And earlier today, I released the episode four of the Core Four series where we discussed Nadia Marcinkova and her relationship, as it were, with Jeffrey Epstein and his criminal enterprise. He instructed Nadia to kiss Courtney and continue to direct all sorts of sexual action between the girls before himself having sex with Nadia. By now, Courtney knew that she was doing what she was doing was wrong, something she had not understood at first. And again, you can understand, right? She was a young girl. She came in naive. She was groomed. Epstein played on her emotions, on her age, on how naive she was. He manipulated her. And I'm sure the core four manipulated her. And we see here Nadia Marcinkova being involved in the abuse like we talked about earlier. So, look, this is a very deep rabbit hole, folks. A very, very deep rabbit hole. But it was too late. Courtney's story was one of many that would emerge over the following decade. A watching world would be horrified by accounts of underage girls being shuttled in Epstein's private plane to lavish destinations around the world in pursuit of his depraved lifestyle. Yeah, well, guess what? Not enough. There was not enough outrage or, hor uh, or people being horrified or else they would have stopped them. There was his house in New York. One of the largest townhouses in Manhattan, his ranch in New Mexico, which he'd bought from the state governor, an apartment in Paris, and his own private island in the U.S. Virgin Islands, Little St. James, which Epstein referred to as Little St. Jeff, but others called Petto Island. The world looked on in disbelief as the full extent of the physical and mental torture to which he subjected his victims was finally exposed. Yeah, and that's pretty much where I slid into this story, huh? I just stumbled face first into this story right around that point when the real horrifying details were were becoming public. And I I can't even imagine being Bradley Edwards, honestly. I just, I can't imagine him for all of these years chasing these sons of bitches to every end of the earth and to have Epstein get arrested and then slip through his fingers by, you know, dying while in custody. I can't even imagine the frustration. Epstein's death in prison last year, while awaiting trial on charges of trafficking underage girls, denied Courtney the chance to tell this tragic and chilling story in court and to see justice done properly. But although Epstein is dead, the women's stories would not, should not die with him, says Edwards. Had it not been for some of the courageous women, he says, there is little doubt Jeffrey Epstein would have continued to harm young girls on a massive scale while globetrotting with his powerful friends. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why these girls are heroes. These survivors who have come forward and told their story and challenged these people, these horrible, disgusting individuals, head on, these are heroes, folks, because they are the ones who stopped this. They're the ones who stopped Jeffrey Epstein in his tracks, basically. It wasn't law enforcement. They just did the arresting. But it was these girls coming forward and saying, no more. Enough is enough. That really led to the arrest of Jeffrey Epstein. I believe I owe it to the good people who risked their privacy and safety to hold Jeffrey Epstein accountable to share what really happened. Bradley J. Edwards, 2020. And you know what? We're lucky that he's coming forward with this information. And I just finished up the book, Relentless Pursuit. Finished it up today, and it is an amazing read. It gives a lot of context, a lot of information that is very important for the case. And it's coming from a source that you definitely know is locked into the case. A source that you know has their all of their ducks in a row when they're discussing what occurred. So if you, if you haven't picked up that book yet, I highly suggest you do. So according to the Daily Mail, that's going to be their last article and it's going to wrap up their coverage of uh, Relentless Pursuit being released. So 
you know, it's been a good run. Those those articles have been very informative and they've been very good additions to the catalog. And uh, look, the story that we just heard on tonight's in tonight's article uh, from about Courtney, it's it's heartbreaking, right? You read it and you want you for I know me, it, it makes my blood pressure rise and it makes me really, really, really upset. But sometimes we have to expose ourselves to things like that and we have to face them head on and we can't avoid them because they're harsh or, you know, they're uncomfortable. Because if we do that, people like this will continue to get away with whatever they want to get away with. You know, we have to uh, face evil head on. And, you know, I know that sounds like a cliche and everything, but in this case, it's true. What else can you, how else can you explain Jeffrey Epstein and his, his, his folk? They're the embodiment of evil. And, you know, there's no, you, you don't, you can't run away from that. You have to face that head on. And that's what these girls are doing every single day. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very important to see how they have come forward and they weathered the storm and they weathered the full on, the full frontal attack of Jeffrey Epstein's powerful lawyers. And when all said and done, Epstein is gone and these gals are still standing. It's a testament to them, and it's a testament to those who have helped them along the way. If you'd like to contact me, you could do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. If you haven't checked out my new podcast yet, you can do that by clicking on the link inside of the description box. The name of the podcast is COVID-19, the pandemic that changed everything. All right, folks, I'll be back tomorrow with our usual schedule. Hope you all have a fantastic evening, and until then...